on our Midwest Farm Report, we have as our special guest one Des Moines businessman and four Central Iowa farmers. Now, uh, the moderator is Coleman Scott of Des Moines. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I hope in this particular meeting that we'll have a chance to bring you a story that, truthfully, is so unusual and so different that while it may appear to be challenging, we hope it will also cause you to do some, very carefully, some soul analysis. All over America, there are men and women who have joined together in bringing this particular program to you. The various members of the National Farm Organization, the NFO, have banded their talents, their hopes, their efforts, their dreams, and together they have sponsored the series of broadcasts. Now, each of these is co-sponsored by the people of your community. If you find that there are bits of information or facts or answers that you might like to have about NFO, they have urged me to ask you to come forward and ask them. You'll find, quite frankly, you'll find this particular insignia all over the area where you live, NFO. You'll find it as we're talking with you on these broadcasts. Over and over and over again, you'll hear NFO. Find out what it means because to you it may mean the absolute difference between truth and fact and the series of misrepresentations that stay all over America with people who are either uninformed or misinformed. Now on this particular show today, we have asked the opportunity to be able to talk with individual men. Now these questions, I can assure you, are 100% unrehearsed. At no time during the entire preparation of this particular show, were any questions asked which in any way could lead toward the questions we're going to bring forward. I have examined some material and I've, I have been invited to tear it apart and to ask questions. As a reporter, I intend to do exactly that. These men who will appear on this particular broadcast are farmers. They all come from the state of Iowa. They are all interested in the very same thing, your protection as a farmer, and as a consumer. Since I've been invited to ask these questions, I have read a, a whole reef of material, and I intend to go into it in a way I think you might have done it too. First, may I present to you a farmer from Story way over to my right. His name is Dick Ort. Dick comes from Story County here in Iowa. Now, beside him and immediately to my right is Gerald Robinson, who comes from Jasper County. All the way down to my left at the end of the table is Henry, uh, is Levi Sutton, who comes from Story, and Henry Vols, who comes from Polk County. I've switched them, I beg your pardon. I have switched them, and I want you to be sure that you remember them. Levi Sutton comes from Story. This is Levi, and on the end is Henry Vols. Now, we're going to ask questions that I said were completely unrehearsed. I think you'll find them both interesting, informative, and we hope challenging, because it is with this area of challenge that we hope to be able to stimulate both your interest and we hope your cooperation. Dick, I'd like to ask you some questions. First, where do you farm? I farm about 20 miles north of Des Moines, Coleman. About 20 miles north of Des Moines. Are you a general farmer, or what type of farming do you do? Yes, you would call it general farming. I have. Uh, livestock and uh, feed all my grain through my livestock. Mm -hmm. Now, when you began to get into this NFO story, how did you happen to get into it? What brought you in in the first place? Well, I had a good neighbor who uh, was more uh, experienced than, than I was. I was just a beginning farmer, and, uh, and you know, you always seek advice, and uh, you can't learn everything in one day. Anyone will know that and uh, you listen to as much advice as is given you and then make up your own mind, and this is what I did. I see. Now, I understand that you are one of the people who, after these broadcasts, have talked with farmers in your neighborhood, people who are friends or neighbors, and that you do this every Monday, that you've taken your time to talk with farmers in your area. What are the reactions of your people, those, for instance, who have not joined NFO? Well, it ranges. It has 
changed over the period of time that NFO has come into being. At first, it was a question of what is the NFO. Uh, Would have been an interesting question. Yes, it was. And now that they know what it is, they ask, what is it doing? Uh, now They're not asking, what is it doing for me yet? They're just asking, what is it doing? Huh? That's right. And we try to tell them what it will do for them uh, and for us if we all can uh, work together. Let me ask you something. When you talk with these farmers and you show them how in order for the average farmer to be able to receive his full and just share of the farm commodity return that he's entitled to, how it would raise the cost of the individual consumer's market so very, very, very little. What is the reaction of the farmer to this? Well, he, in, in some cases, realizes this, but then he is at a loss himself to know what, how to get, get it there, how to uh, improve his lot. Well, when you explain to him that the basic purpose of NFO is one of collective bargaining with, with all of the farmers, together helping all of the suppliers and processors to be able to achieve the same result without the cutthroat competition, then what does he say? Or does he just sit there and say, well, I don't know, I want to think about it? That's, that's really uh, the usual answer that you get. I'll think about <laughs> it. But uh, really, we, we don't stop to think about it. And that is, that is our problem. We say we're going to do something uh, uh, like you've got a job. You say, I'll do this on a rainy day. Well, this may be fine, but this uh, collective bargaining, or what are we going to do with, uh, to improve agriculture? We can't put that off to a rainy day. There's something we have to do now. I saw a sign not so long ago that said, the farm you save may be your own. What seems to be their reaction to this thought? Well, I think they really realize this, but then they hate to admit it in a lot of cases. Well, nobody likes, nobody likes to think that he's become a part of a, of a tradition of the vanishing American, and that's actually what happened. Uh, the President of the United States has recently pointed out, just reading the article here tonight again, of the tremendous change that is going to be made by the federal government. It looks as though it's actually being made to force them away from the farm. About a million more farms going out, going out of existence, or a million farm families being forced off the farm, now, this, this is uh, obviously a million uh, people or a million families that have to be absorbed into the stream of, of industrial commerce. Here are people who are geared to be able to grow, to plant, to operate farms. Uh, if suddenly they're not in the farm, what happens to those small towns where they've been doing business? Do they disappear too? Then what do they do with those merchants that live in them? Or is that a part of the chain reaction that they don't talk about? Well, I'm afraid this is uh, some of the... Uh after effects or the side effects which go out of the farmer being eliminated and i think we have seen this in all of our uh, small towns uh, throughout the years uh, increasingly becoming more evident in the last i would say five years well let me, let me let's bring jerry into this thing immediately seated beside dick ort is uh, gerald robinson who comes from jasper also of the state of Iowa. Jerry, what, uh, what happens with you now? How did you happen to get into NFO? Well, I was uh, invited one evening to go to a meeting in my hometown, and I did not know what the meeting would be about or anything, but uh, I went and, and decided I liked what I'd heard that night and uh, joined NFO that very evening. All right, you too are one of these people who talk to people on Monday mornings, aren't you? Yes. And other days on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. In other words, your basic farming, you have been actually able to set aside a basic part of your week to go out and talk about the protection of other people's property. Is that it? Yes. Tell them the story about the, the ideas of NFO. This is true. If you plan your work, you can go out one day a week and talk to the farmers. And I always start out uh, giving the reasons why I, the main reasons why I joined NFO, and uh, there are four of them, basically, that uh, only farmers can belong to the NFO, and number two, NFO cannot be in business of any, of any kind. Number three, every step that is taken in the NFO, anything that needs to be ratified, is approved by a two-thirds vote at the county level. And number four, and most important of all, I feel, is that NFO is the only organization promoting bargaining power in the marketplace, trying to promote a better price based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Well, that's a good enough reason. Now, when you begin to tell this very same story to your friends and neighbors, what happens? Then? What is the reaction of the farmer today after you've been, you've been talking with him now for a long time? What is his reaction today? The man who has not yet joined NFO, what is his reason why he doesn't join? Uh, the only 
real reasons they can give are not really good reasons. Some of them say that uh, they do not like holding actions, and uh, I feel that they do not understand a holding action. They think that maybe the only program NFO has is a holding action, and that's just a very small part of it. Uh, it isn't even mentioned in the membership agreement. And some of them, very seldom anymore, you will run into a person that totally objects to NFO. They all agree with what you're trying to do. Everybody objects, but they want to wait and see what you're going to do about it. Is this, that it? This is true. They want to wait and see. And uh, how long they feel they can wait, I don't know. Uh, Jerry, one of my favorite stories revolves around an experience I had down south many years ago. I was talking with a businessman quite set in his ways, a man who was well along in years. And uh, I laid out this plan, and I said, what do you think of it? And he said, I like it, Mr. Scott. And I said, well, let's buy it. And he said, well, I, I can't do it today. And I said, why not? And he said, well, very simple. I can't do it today because my dog is sick. And I said, well, what does your dog being sick have to do with this? And he said, Mr. Scott, it ain't got nothing to do with it, but when you ain't going to do something, one excuse is just as good as another. Now, maybe you're talking to some people with sick dogs. Maybe they haven't been able to make up their minds yet. You know, this, this story of the, of the uh, with this withholding action, if I may, I've examined this particular part of the story. I've asked a lot of questions. I've asked questions of people who have nothing to do with NFO. I've talked with people in supermarkets. I've talked with beer distributors. I've talked with soft drink distributors, uh, automobile uh, agencies, and I've asked the same question. Does your business, is your business ever affected by a holding action? And they said, of course. When the price drops on our product, the factory withholds them from the market until the market becomes more favorable to them. This is a holding action. When uh, the price is unprofitable to a, to a supermarket to carry it, we don't carry the product. We take it out of our line. We withhold it from the shelf until it is more equitable so that we share in it. In other words, we have a withholding action. Now, a withholding action means many things to many people. As a matter of fact, I'm quite sure that all of us personally engage in withholding action. There are products that we would like to buy, but we don't buy them because we don't feel that we can get enough back because of what they cost us. So we withhold our money from them, and thus we force them to meet our terms. Isn't this what a, what a withholding action is? Isn't it, isn't it a holding action to, to attempt to hold back from an unfavorable market a product that would do nothing else but destroy the price? You know, they used to have a line that used to hang in the, in the supermarkets of Persia, out in the uh, marketplace, and it said, caveat emptor, which meant, let the buyer beware. I think the farmer today is the only man I've ever known who went into the market, and he should be saying, let the seller beware. He's the only man who comes on bended knees and says, what will you give me for my year's work? I don't know of any other man who will invest $150,000 and be expected to receive less return for a year's work than if he had put it in some kind of a mutual fund, for instance, and refused to work. If he went on relief, he would have lived better and actually made more money out of the investment than he would off the farm and having done a year's labor. Now, one of these days, we've had a chance to get into some real exciting series on figures of how much work and how much investment it would have to take for individual types of farming to be able to produce a thousand dollars additional net income. Now, not only is it an astronomical amount of figures, but until we can positively show them to be true, authenticated and graphed, I don't want to mention them. But I've seen them, and they are almost unbelievable. In many cases, it goes to show completely that after you reach a certain figure, the more you invest, the more certain you are to lose money, and there's nothing you can do about it. It doesn't make any difference how much you work. And the same thing is true with others. Now, let me bring in here, if I may, Henry Volz from uh, Polk County. Henry, how long have you been in an FO? About six years. How did you happen to get in? What brought you into this thing? Well, uh, my neighbor came you and, mean another farmer? Yes, and encouraged me to join. At, at that time, I didn't know too much about it, and, uh, but it did look too uh, good to me. I thought there was a need to organize. Uh, a need to, to do what? What was it, what was it that, that appealed to you? Well, to get a better price. See, that was back in 59, uh, 
and 60, and things at that time seemed to be getting worse all the time, and uh, very well, little right, being done. Uh, very little being done about it. They have gotten worse so far as the return from the hourly labor, hasn't it? That's right. So you're absolutely right when you get in in 1958. You saw a need then to be able to bargain collectively for the sale of your commodity, right? That's the way it seemed to me. Now, since that time, you also have, have actually gone out and have used your time to talk to other men to join in the same activity, haven't you? Somewhat, not as much as some of the other fellas, but Well, of course, nobody some. can as much as some fellas can, but then where you farm, what, uh, what is your type of farming now in Polk County? What uh, do you do? It's general farming. I feed uh, around 100 head of cattle a year and raise a couple hundred uh, head of hogs, and uh, the rest is grain farming. It, uh, my land is all row crop, and uh, it's diversified in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were not in NFO today, if, they, if you had never at any single time heard anything about it. Now, this is a loaded question. No reason in the world why I can't ask them loaded, because these people have no idea what I'm going to ask. And we, and we kept it open so that we could ask these questions exactly as they came. Henry, if you were not a member of NFO, and if at this very moment you were to be sitting out there instead of here listening, and we were to pose one question that would get you an answer, that would cause you to want to join NFO or examine more carefully, what would that be? What one thing would appeal to you as a farmer the most? You mean uh, as far it as NFO? It would cause you to become interested in NFO. Well, to get a fair price, uh, to uh, uh, get a price that reflects your management and your labor and your life's investment and uh, things of that nature. You mean if you thought that there was a possibility because of your assistance in this particular activity where all the farmers went together and they used their collective bargain and they used their combined thinking to be able to market profitably not only for the farmer but for the supplier, the processor, and the ultimate consumer. Because let's face it, today the farmer is paying a subsidy to the consumer. Yes, he is. Now, Very definitely. If you then, as a farmer and as a merchant, because that's what you are, you are a manufacturer, you manufacture a raw, a raw material. The possibility then of being able to receive a just return from your product is the one thing that would cause you to become more interested in NFO than anything else, right? That would be the main thing, yes. Then I think that the benefit of your judgment would be, let us say to those farmers out there, that this is one place where collectively those achievements can be reached. Is that it? That's right. Now you've been in it since 1959. Would you say that your time has been well spent? Oh, definitely so, yes. Would you say that you're a lot further ahead than you were I think since so. in 1959? I think so. I think farmers generally are, uh, for, uh, from the results uh, that NFO has done so far, even. I had a chance to go through your national headquarters, your national organization, and I have never seen an organization more carefully, more complete, uh, completely run. Every single thing in there was laid out to the most minute examination. There wasn't an inch of space. There wasn't, there wasn't one single portion of a penny's waste in that total operation, which means that this was being run totally to be able to do exactly what they said it was, to be able to accomplish a definite goal, which was collective bargaining for the American farmer. And through this, a fair price for the consumer. I was ex extremely excited by the way it was being run can't tell you my, my complete approval of it. As a businessman, I know what must have been in it. I know how hard they have worked to accomplish it. It's a fantastic organization, and it has been put together and operated entirely by farmers. Now, it was started originally by farmers who saw the basic need. It had the assistance and advice of other men who had been lifelong farmers and were good, sound businessmen. And I not only was impressed, but I wanted to pass that story along when I had the chance. And I can't think of a better place to do it than here. Levi, Levi Sutton comes from story. Levi, what is your story in farming? What do you farm? What kind of farm? What do you have? I've got a general farm, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Scott. Farm about 380 acres. I run a beef herd of about 64 cows. And I feed my calves out, and I raise around 200 head of hogs a year. And I raise some beans. Just a general farmer. Now, I did, this is the only loaded question I asked anybody in this place. I did say, an investment much the same as yours, conservatively placed on the cost of today's market to be able to buy or to hold or to, to classify 
How would you classify that as a farm investment? I think you told me about $150,000 plus, didn't you? I would say at least $150,000, and it could be more. Do you run this entirely by yourself? Do you do all of the labor, or do you hire extra no. help, or what is the story? I have a hard, hard man to help me because I can't handle a loan. It's too much, and uh, I've got a little older, you know. Well, so have we all. My productive years are uh, coming to a past. We don't like to admit this, but it happens to all of us. Well, I, I beg your pardon. Go ahead. I was going to ask you, what was it that brought you into this particular NFO idea? Well, Coleman, I was the first member to join NFO in Story County, Iowa. Well, right. then you must have been aware of something, that's for sure. I went to a meeting. They read the membership agreement, and they explained it to me. And I told the boys that night our national vice president was the one that had the meeting. I told him that I would sign the membership agreement at the very next meeting I went to, which was about 10 days later, and I signed the membership agreement. And I've never been sorry. I have received the best education that any farmer could ever receive through NFO, because I have found out things in the NFO that I never would have known before, and it's very impossible for the individual farmer to find out without an organization like the NFO working for us to get this information out to the farmers for them to thoroughly understand their problem, how to combat their problem. We have to have collective bargaining Coleman the same as every other business or we cannot exist. There's no question about it. You know, I recently have heard the story said that the independent merchant, the small businessman who runs a grocery store, but a well-run store, today is becoming uh, not only well accepted again, but he has become an important entity as an individual item. Now, I began to check into this. His investment is a, is a large one. He is certainly not a, a competitor to the great big huge chains, but the individual businessman who runs a grocery store who is making a profit is joining a buying and a selling unit. There is no question about it. He has a way of buying collectively. He's able to take multiple discounts and uh, to say to a wholesaler, we will buy this much under these conditions. He takes complete discounts on everything that he buys at the best way that he can. And this is what makes him competitive. Now, what you're saying, and I think this is, this is the thing we were trying to get across so many times in our previous discussions, is that if the farmer could sell like the buyer buys, then the farmer could receive a fair share for his product as well as everybody else. And the individual farmer does not get it today, does he? He does not, and Coleman, another thing I'd like to add to this is, if it weren't for the individual farmer staying as an individual, as they tell him he is, these chain stores could not buy at a cheaper rate and turn around and put it on the bargaining counter to the public. If we were organized together, like we're doing in the NFO, we could set the price on our product the same as a chain store or any other business does, and we could get the price but we have to be organized together to do it, just as they are. Then essentially the basic, the basic uh, hole in the bottom of the boat is the instability of the open market, That's plus exactly the surplus. Right. Exactly right. I came across a comment the other day uh, in all of these notes. You know, I came to this program completely prepared. I had spent probably six days of reading. I had amassed so much material that it was impossible for me to do anything else except be a complete bore with my own knowledge. So for this reason, when I brought this in, I discovered that while everybody else had read them, they were already old hat to them. Everybody knew them, but they were exciting with bits of material to me. But among the thing I noticed was a note there that said that with all of the surpluses and all of the endless amount of material food existence that we now have in the United States, if everybody ate as everybody eats today, we got only about 10 days supply of food actually on hand. So when they talk about all these fantastic amounts of surplus, the surplus lies today in the farmer's production. This is where it is. He's only about 10 days away from an open market, isn't he? Essentially 10 days away from an open market. Well, a few days ago, I had a chance to get out and I talked with a group in one of the individual areas. So many of these meetings are just exactly like I remember them when I was a kid. And I used to go to a, to a meeting out in a, in a township. My people uh, one time lived in a township of 
600 people. And it was a great gathering point when we got together. We used to look forward to meeting. And we discussed so many things. And not, not only did the men discuss farm products, but among the, the younger fellows, the fellows my age, was the question about whether or not my big brother can lick your big, big brother. You know, one of those things. But I noticed that these meetings that I've attended now, the complete, the complete gathering knowledge of the willingness to spread information, the, the open discussion of how to be able to accomplish things, the feeling that something can be done is now beginning to, to permeate the, the outer group. I felt this now in so many places. Do you fellows feel this? That even the fellow who hasn't yet joined into NFO, he says they're working on something that has sense to it. Do you feel this? Do you get that feeling or did I just imagine it? What do you think, uh, Dick? Do you have that feeling that, that maybe e every farmer is hoping that something will be done? I'm sure of that, Coleman, but uh, still, uh, they, they're afraid to jump in the water and, and uh, swim, too. They're afraid of what? I, I don't know what it is. A farmer has been an individual for such a long time that he has uh, relied too much on his own uh, ability to get along, and, uh, and uh, he can see that we've got a good th thing going here. He's all for us, but uh, he must stop and realize that uh, for this thing to really uh, be successful, it requires the uh, cooperation of all the farmers, not just the few that are trying to uh, bring this program about. Jerry, do you, do you agree with that? I agree with that. You, you hear uh, very few farmers say anything that, uh, against NFO. They think the theory is all right, but uh, for some reason they want to wait and see. It kind of sounds to me. My mother said that they used to tell her when she was a little girl that there was no sense in wasting the time of a school teacher to teach a farm girl to read and write. All she had to learn was how to cook a good mess of vittles, but you're not going to learn on my good food. So maybe that's the same old case. Today we've come a long ways. May I ask Henry Volz, Henry, do you agree with this assumption that everybody says something should be done, but everybody wants to wait and find out who's going to do it? Yes, I do. You think uh, that's the case? And I think there's a general awakening uh, that uh, something maybe is being done, and uh, I think uh, I think it will come in in the near future. Levi, do you subscribe to it? Well, Coleman, I'd like to add just a little bit to that. I think we have an educational program, and I have found it in my experience in working in NFO and talking to farmers, which I do about five days a week every week through the winter. And I've definitely found that once they understand it, they'll join it. Now, some of them is just a little harder to get to understand it than others. <laughs> <laughs> but once they thoroughly understand what we're trying to do, <clears throat> what it will do for them, and why they must do it in order to maintain the family type farm and I think I think the thing they should think about is their children we possibly can get by but how about our children well in a generation where we have mortgaged not only our future but the future of our children and our children's children and our children's 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 children it might be good to take a look at what is left may I thank you for the use of your time and thank you for the hospitality of your home and the opportunity to join with you this program, brought to you by the NFO, has been sponsored by the friends and neighbors of your locale, the family who lives next door. Thank you very much. NFO members of this listing area are calling on the rest of the nation's farmers to help solve our farm problem. Attend NFO meetings in your area. Find out the truth about the National Farmers Organization, and you too will want to become a member. <laughs>